Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the uh, Benoit and all the advisors for um, the honor of inviting me to this conference, uh, especially as I don't work anymore in nanocrystals. I've been trying for decades now to <laughs> uh, leave this to my uh, former students, but it seems once every year there's another project that we have to be at least partially involved in. So today I thought I would talk about the uh, <clears throat> early days of uh, colloidal quantum dots, mostly historical here. And then my more recent interest in uh, one-dimensional and two-dimensional systems to compare and contrast with the quantum dots. And so uh, a lot of it will be on the carbon nanotubes. So the colloidal quantum dots, you know, this is a project which began uh, in the late 1982 in Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, in my case. And I should tell you a little bit about myself. You know, I was 14 years out of graduate school before beginning to work on nanocrystals. And I was trained in gas phase, small molecule kinetics and spectroscopy, trying to understand what the electrons are doing. And uh, I never studied optics when I was in graduate school. I certainly never studied solid state physics. I never knew anything about materials. I taught myself solid state physics uh, by reading Cattell's textbook one hour a day after I had left graduate school. And uh, in Bell Labs, I first started working on, uh, as I say, small molecule spectroscopy, and then it became small molecule spectroscopy in uh, rare gas matrices, trapped at low temperature in rare gas matrices, and then tried to evolve more into the more of the mainstream of chemistry, and I began to work on organic photochemistry. Uh, pump probe Raman spectroscopy was the experiment I was doing when we first became interested in uh, nanocrystals. You know, this is uh, one photon to start some chemical process, and then a second photon some uh, nanoseconds or picoseconds later to take uh, Raman spectra, resonance Raman spectra of intermediates in chemical reactions. And the particular reaction I was interested in at that point was the surface oxidation or reduction of organic molecules adsorbed on semiconductor electrode surfaces. And uh, so in order to get a high volume between high surface area between the uh, solid and the liquid, we began to use colloidal samples rather than bulk crystal, bulk electrodes. And so we, there were these recipes in the paper, in the literature, uh, some coming from Arnold Henglein and earlier workers on making colloids. And so we copied those recipes. And then at one point noticed uh, on the first day of, well, okay. So yeah, so on, the, on the first day of making a colloid, the band gap was sometimes larger than it was on the second day. And second day, it was the bulk band gap. On the first day, it was a little bit smaller. Uh, these were aqueous precipitations of cadmium sulfide. I didn't know what that meant. For, I first thought it was maybe a problem with the stoichiometry of the particle. You know, on the first day, it was the wrong stoichiometry. We checked that with the TEM, and t that was the first time I ever saw a TEM in my life. And uh, it was a size effect. You know, the first day the particles were smaller. The second day, they were they were getting to be larger. And uh, so uh, that that really got my attention, as you might imagine. It was a great experiment in Bell Labs because uh, I could work on things in which I had no real background. You know, it was uh, uh, I never wrote a uh, a, a budget. In, in all the time I was there. I never wrote a proposal in all the time I was there to change fields or to think. Of, I just had to go and talk to my boss, my department head and the director, and have a short discussion and, you know, 30 minutes discussion. This is a good idea. Let's go ahead. And so I could devote my time to do this, you know. Not possible today with, the, you know, applying to the NSF and, and all of that. This is Bell Labs in, uh, at the present time. My office was actually on the end of the, of the uh, end of the, of the building here, facing the camera, and you see it's it's gone. And the laboratory where this work is done is gone. You know they're tearing down the building because they don't do physical science anymore. They have to pay real estate taxes on this, and um, they'll save money by tearing it down. So the question was, why was the band gap a function of size? And being a spectroscopist, the first thing I thought of was uh, Maxwell's equations. There are size effects in Maxwell's equations. And I remember I sat down and read through uh, chapter 16 of the optics textbook, Born in Wolf, which is on me theory, to try and understand, you know, if this could come from me theory. And it, uh, you know, there, in, in me theory, when there, uh, there's a resonance in the optical absorption cross-section when the wavelength is the same as the diameter of the particle, 
but these particles are a factor of 100 smaller than the wavelength of light, and uh, in that limit, the absorption spectrum should be independent of size, and the intensity of the spectrum should, should scale as the volume of the particle. So it was not Maxwell's equations. That had made, it had to be Schrodinger's equation. You know, the, actually, the, dia the complex dielectric constant, wavelength-dependent dielectric constant, or the basic wave functions, had to be a function of size. And that was a surprise because I knew that metallic particles came into being bulk metals pretty quickly, you know. And so if you have a metallic particle of 30, a platinum particle of 30 platinum atoms, it behaves very much like a bulk platinum redox potential. But that's because the um, Fermi levels in the center of the band, semiconductor particles, you're dealing with the states on the edge of the band. They develop much more slowly. So in thinking about this, we, did, we started down this road of simple electrostatic modeling, but the most important thing we did was try to find ways to make better particles and particles of smaller size, starting at that point. And I realized pretty quickly this was a very good project for Bell Laboratories because it was a basic research project that was relevant to the business. To the, you know, the business was the future of microelectronics. This is one of the great, you know, uh, success stories of mankind. You know, your chip, if you have a modern computer, I, uh, Intel I, I, I7 core chip, 731 million transistors on that one chip. You can buy it for $100 or something like that, right? Tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. So it was clear that the knowledge we would gain, and maybe even the particles themselves, would be relevant as the transistor, de as transistor design got to be smaller and smaller. I also liked the field because it was more related to chemistry. You know, the bonding in semiconductors is very similar to the bonding in molecules, so there should be a natural evolution going up, you know, a natural way to understand this going from molecules up to bulk semiconductors. So uh, there were all of these things happening simultaneously, this idea of how to deal with the theory of this and also the synthetic challenge, more important, that's much more important than the theoretical challenge. Could you actually make particles of intermediate size? Could you do things with them? Could you vary the surface chemistry? And because the synthesis was and remains, I would almost say lousy, you know, or not, you know, not perfect, there was this tremendous driving force to, me to measure the physical properties one nanocrystal at a time, and then this technology uh, challenge to use them uh, once we get the halfway decent synthesis going. And so here is the synthesis that we started off with. And, uh, well, let me say two things. First, this, uh, for the young graduate students, this is how we wrote, this is how we gave talks before the invention of PowerPoint. You see my handwriting up there. This is, and the cartoon drawings of what's going on. Uh, this is the state of the art so, sort of, uh, you know, 1988 or 1989 as we were doing it. Uh, Paul Olivasados came as a postdoc. Paul and I talked for a couple of weeks, and then we decided the best thing to do was to apprentice ourselves to the young uh, organometallic chemist Mike Steigerwald, who was just setting up his laboratory in Bell Labs, and to try and invent better uh, synthetic methods. I thought water was very important. You know, the synthesis was the um, field comes out of the um, precipitation of these salts in, in water. That's the original uh, way it was done. So we tried to do this uh, inverse micelle preparation, uh, you know, doing precipitations in small water pools inside inverse micelle solutions. Uh, you know, you might make cadmium-50, selenium-50 uh, from cadmium ions and a selenium organometallic reagent, and you could have one nanocrystal in a water pool and then these things would be protected from other uh, fusion with other nanocrystals simply by the micelle structure. This was done at room temperature. And uh, that more or less worked. You could take optical spectra of this. Then we figured out at one point that if we added reagents very slowly, they, could, they would grow on particles that already existed, but they would not nucleate any new particles. And so you would have, you could have controlled growth, you know, so you could start with small particles and then um, grow them larger. That meant that these surfaces were still reactive inside the particles like that. Take optical spectra as a function of size as the things were growing. Then we began to think more about the surface of these things and uh, just figured out we could do optical exotic chemistry. 
Moonji came as a postdoc, we worked, went through this sequence. And so you could start with a small water pool and then do, uh, make a, uh, a little particle in the water pool, then add a reagent, trimethylsilyl, sel, uh, phenyl, trimethylsilyl selenide, and uh, cap the particle with phenyl groups. You would have a phenyl bonded to the selenium in principle. And I remembered, well, let me say human memory is uh, frail. And after 30 years, you should take what I say, you know, with a grain of salt. I remember the first time we did this, or um, it, um, the particles fell out of solution. And they, they, we had this pale yellow particle, pale yellow powder on the bottom of the beaker. At first, that was a problem. What the heck are we going to do with this stuff, you know? It, and then realized that, well, it's not so bad because this is what synthetic chemists do. They isolate a product of the reaction, you know? So this pale yellow powder was the nanoparticles themselves. They came out of solution because uh, they were hydrophobic at this point, uh, so they didn't like being in the, in, the, in, in the water here, and the phenyl cap particles were not very soluble in heptane. Fell to the bottom. What are we going to do with it? So I think it was Mike who decided, you know, well, the phenyl groups cap the selenium. In principle, the, the, the uh, cadmium is bare on the surface, and so maybe we should add some solvent that will uh, coordinate with the empty orbital on the cadmium. Let's try and redissolve this yellow powder in pyridine. So we dissolved it a little bit, and we, we, we added pyridine, and part of it went up into the pyridine. Then there was some thought about, well, what could we do better with this? And uh, we decided to try and heat the solution to see if it, we could dissolve more of the yellow powder. And more of it did dissolve all right, and the color changed a little bit, you know, when we refluxed it in pyridine. Then we took the optical spectrum a second time, you know, after we had refluxed it for a while in pyridine. And I remember being amazed when this exciton peak sharpened up, you know. That was the first time it had any sense that temperature was important. So then we realized that we were making better quality particles by running this reaction at higher temperature. And so <clears throat> in the remaining months, we tried other Lewis-based solvents. The first one was tributylphosphine. Uh, this was uh, Munji and uh, Mike Steigerwald and myself were, do were doing this at this point. And it was uh, not reproducible. We couldn't get it, it to dissolve in tributylphosphine. And this was one, bo one bottle of tributylphosphine tri tri would work, and the next bottle would not work. And the reason was that one bottle was partially oxidized and the next bottle was not partially oxidized. So Mike suggested, let's just mix in, you know, 10% oxide or 20% oxide. That worked like a charm. We could dissolve these things really, really great at that point. So we began this process of starting with the pale yellow powder, which is, has a few nanocrystals in it, but has a lot of just sort of very small fragments of, of reagents like this. And, uh, and heating this up. You see here is 230 centigrade for three hours. Make these beautiful red solutions. This shows our understanding of the surface chemistry at that time. I thought it was uh, entirely Lewis space bonding and, you know, and it was uh, data bonds from oxygen to the cadmium. We understand now that this is uh, mostly wrong. Surface is not stoichiometric, you know, and there's ionic bonding on the surface as well as covalent bonding, uh, dative bonding, and uh, my young colleague, uh, John Owen, will talk about this later in, in the meeting. Very nice solution. We, tr we tried our best to characterize these doggone things, you see, and we actually did selenium-77 NMR with Peter Reinders, and we, Matt Marcus took these particles out to Brookhaven, did selenium and cadmium XF, and worked very hard to get a good understanding of these particles at that time. Probably more effort down here than we should have put in because the quality was still not really great. <laughs> I myself was very much influenced by this chemistry approach to the theory of the, of the electronic structure of these particles, which comes all the way back to Slater and to Charles Coulson. Uh, starting, you know, with a degenerate basis set, nearest neighbor bonding, uh, sigma bonding between, in this case, silicon, one silicon to the next, two electrons in a bonding orbital, empty pi st an empty uh, sigma star orbital. So from this picture, this sort of textbook picture of the evolution of the band structure, you can see that a nanocrystal should have discrete molecular orbitals, although pretty close together. 
and it should have a larger band gap than the asymptotic limit of the bulk bands. The other mathematically equivalent way of going at this was from uh, the particle in a box solid state physics uh, point of view, thinking about the de Broglie wavelength. Uh, this was natural because I was aware of the super lattice physics in gallium arsenide. You know, this had been done five years earlier or something like this. So I was aware of the quantum mechanics of that, and so we tried to work out the correct quantum mechanics for the three-dimensional confinement, you know, um, starting, starting from the one-dimensional confinement, which had already been done. And there are also electrostatic terms here. You can see this uh, Coulomb attraction, and then there are some other terms here which are uh, I, I, not on the slide here. This comes from dielectric solvation theory. You know, and so as a physical chemist, I was uh, always very interested in dielectric solvation. You know, and in, in chemical reactions, the higher the dielectric constant of the solvent, the more important are ionic intermediates in, in, in the reactions. I, high, dielectric con high dielectric constant stabilizes ions versus covalent species or neutral species. So worked out the, basically the solvation energy for, in this case, you can see the formula for a single real charge, positive charge, in a dielectric sphere of high dielectric constant surrounded by a, a region of low dielectric constant. This would give the dielectric solvation energy uh, for one charge in a nanocrystal. We know this is important already just from the bulk solid state physics because in the bulk solid state physics, the Coulomb interaction is screened between the electron and the hole in the exciton. And so it follows automatically that if the Coulomb interaction is screened in the bulk material, then the dielectric solvation energy of the individual electrons and holes has to be very important one by one. So we tried to work this out as well. Here is some of John's uh, PowerPoint <laughs> uh, slides showing what I'm talking about. For cadmium selenide, you know, the molecular orbitals form between selenium 4p and cadmium 5s. Uh, when the synthesis goes well, a very nice uh, absorption spectrum and a strong luminescence. The Achilles heel of these particles is the fact that, it's S that what's involved here is sp3 hybridization. And so on the surface of any particle like this, you have these broken bonds, you know. And uh, if you don't do anything on the surface, you have uh, surface states and they provide uh, non-radiative recombination, a trap emission at low temperature. And so right from the beginning, you know, we were thinking about what to do about this, uh, the surface of the particles. And in one case, you have, you know, uh, passivation by pyridine and uh, phenyl radicals. But it was even clear in the old colloid literature that you could grow zinc sulfide on top of cadmium selenide. I remember there's some paper back in the 1970s where people looked at just an aqueous solution of cadmium sulfide, and then they actually grew zinc sulfide on the top of it, and the luminescence quantum yield went higher. So there was some capping effect, and we tried to do the same thing, and I, I worked myself a long time to grow uh, you know, zinc sulfide on the top of cadmium selenide, and to try and characterize it using Auger's spectroscopy, if I remember correctly. That was more or less wasted effort because uh, the particles were so poor, the cap particles were so poor, we didn't know how to grow them well, that you know, the, the capping was very fragmentary, but we tried. As everyone in the room knows now, this is a highly developed art with the uh, graded index uh, alloy type of composition changing from the center to the surface and the different levels of confinement between the electron and the hole. So about 1993 or 1994, we were still struggling with this and the main problem we had in mind was that you know, there was still this wide distribution of sizes and shapes and especially distribution of surface stoichiometries. And so there was a strong driving force to look at these particles one at a time. Uh, uh, this is a perfect situation for single molecule spectroscopy since every molecule in the sample is different. And uh, it was, my friend, it was my friend Tim Harris who hired a postdoc, Jay Troutman, whose uh, assignment was to try and invent an optical method to you know, look at one particle at a time. Uh, it was Eric Betzig in Murray Hill who made the breakthrough, who figured out actually how you could actually do single molecule luminescence spectroscopy. And he and Jay Troutman worked on this uh, quite closely together. And then we developed this method uh, 
And with Munji and Munji's students, Manoj Nirmal, we uh, started to look at single molecule spectroscopy. This is one of these things, you know, it always strikes me, you know, this, it was hard as hell the first time through this, you know, and, but uh, it's, once you know what to do, it's very easy. This could have been done in 1970 or something like that, you know, but it was just, people didn't have the idea to do this right. As Soon as we ran this experiment, we discovered the blinking immediately, you know, these particles were blinking on and off under the light beam, and we built a, tar a model like this for the photoionization and the recombination and tried to understand everything that was going on. This is a problem, we'd like to get rid of it. And in, in fact, you know, that's the whole purpose of this uh, core shell structure on the previous slide. But this leads to basically this, after 30 years now, this application. You know, one of the great inventions, really great inventions, is this blue gallium nitride uh, laser. And that's going to revolutionize the world in time, lead to solid state lighting, you know, and a vast improvement of efficiencies once this uh, material science develops. There is a technological problem, how to make a display, as we heard earlier this morning, you know, a display, a three-color display, uh, red, green, and the blue of the laser itself uh, for human eyes, most possible vivid colors, and the lowest possible consumption of electricity. You know, this is the goal. And it's possible uh, that the ultimate technology will be this blue gallium nitride laser plus the use of the red and the green uh, quantum dots to downshift. Technology has a life of its own. You know, it's very dangerous to predict what's actually going to be used five years from now. It's just, there's so many different people around the world working on problems, and you never know what will come from left field and actually change your view of how things will go. So we don't know if this is going to be a long-term technology, but there's a fighting chance at this point. Time will tell. I also tried to work out the uh, size regimes, you know, thinking through this kind of physical diagram uh, as a function of diameter, the molecular regime, quantum dot regime, and um, uh, the actual size resonance in Maxwell's equations, polariton regime. There's also kinetic regimes in kinetics, uh, this for single electron hole pairs and then for multiple electron hole pairs interacting with each other. All of that some time ago. So when I left Bell Labs and came to Columbia in 1996, the main experimental technique I brought with me was this single molecule luminescence, single nanocrystal luminescence, and that whole approach of going at things. And I began to read papers about carbon nanotubes. Ajima made a great discovery, you know, with finding the carbon nanotubes in 1991, and that led to all this work on graphene. Everyone's familiar with the unit cell of the graphene and the whole idea of rolling up uh, pieces of graphene to make carbon nanotubes. These are really interesting uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is electron correlation is very strong. You know, this is the uh, Brillouin zone of, of, graph, of graph, graphene here, and these purple lines are the allowed states of the carbon nanotube uh, in this direction going around the circumference and this direction along the length. And so for a semiconducting tube, you have these uh, transverse bands and you have continuous optical absorption band to band like this. So we set out to try and think about, you know, whether this was really right in the carbon nanotubes. And uh, uh, with Matt Sphere, um, there's a problem on spectroscopy, how to deal with the carbon nanotubes. You know, some are metals and some are semiconductors. And so they all don't fluoresce. And the semiconductors fluoresce, but often the quantum yield is very low. So it's hard, hard as heck, to do uh, single tube luminescence. And it would also be hard as heck to do absorption spectra, the, you know, just to, uh, to take the absorption spectrum of one tube. You know, that, you, that might be one part in 10 to the sixth or one part in 10 to the seventh of the visible light. You'd have to measure the attenuation at that level. So we started to think about the Rayleigh scattering as a way to go at this. And that was because I was working simultaneously in the um, single molecule SIRS effect with silver particles and Rayleigh scattering there is the standard way of dealing with them. So we worked out how to do Rayleigh scattering on single tubes and that showed immediately, uh, working very closely with Tony Heinz and Fang Wang, uh, this uh, strong excitonic structure for the metallic tubes as well as the semiconducting tubes and carbon nanotubes. Without correlation, uh, if the electron in the hole are eigenfunctions of the momentum, they're delocalized along the entire length of the carbon nanotube, but physically one attracts the other. 
and the Coulomb attraction is actually fairly strong because the electric field begins on one carrier and terminates on the other character. Part of it fringes out of the carbon nanotube into the vacuum where there's no screening. So the screening, for example, is far less than it is in a three-dimensional semiconductor. Coulomb attraction is stronger. That means the bound state should exist. So you have this exciton that, that can exist you know, below the dissociation limit where the free carriers move up and down the entire length of the tube. With Gordana, who, who is here today, who measured the uh, binding energy of the exciton below the uh, band gap of the tube, and that turned out to be really strong, four-tenths of a volt binding energy for the exciton. This is a true exciton as opposed to what exists in a uh, nanoparticle. True exciton bound by the Coulomb interaction and able to dissociate into free carriers. And if you, if you think about it with a hydrogenic model, if you have a four-tenths of a volt binding energy for the exciton, the Coulomb attraction is actually eight-tenths of a volt when averaged over the wave function, you know, so it's almost the same size as the band gap itself. Very strong excitonic formation. The other thing which this strong correlation comes, strong Coulomb-Coulomb interaction, is this um, <clears throat> multiple exciton generation, which we'll hear a lot about in this meeting. Most physical systems, you know, if you have a, a very high energy electron in a very high energy hole, they will relax to the band gap by production of a heat, vibrational relaxation. This gives the shockley queezer limit. This is in competition with relaxation to the band edge by exciton creation. Uh, there's no real reason why uh, this can, it's a, it's a kinetic question, which, which both processes occur, which one is actually faster? Most all physical systems, this is faster. This one is driven by strong electron correlation. And I show you this paper from uh, Fed Navoris because I have great admiration for this paper. He showed, Fed Navoris showed that this process of hot electron relaxation by exciton creation across the band gap is extremely fast in carbon nanotubes. So the experiment was that you lay a carbon nanotube across a, a source in a drain and apply a small voltage here. You can inject an electron into the conduction band on one end and it accelerates and as it gets higher and higher above the conduction band edge here, uh, it reaches a point where it can relax to the edge in one step by creation of an exciton. This was extremely strong. He actually calculated theoretically as well, the rate was 10 to the 15th per second. This is as fast as anything can be in molecular science. You know, it, uncertainty principle width of one electron volt. It means that the electrons are so strongly coupled one to the next that uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not productive or maybe not so uh, useful for our thinking to think in zero order that you have individual electrons and then as some kind of higher order you have coupled electrons. It, it would be better if we could invent some kind of theory where the coupled electrons were directly considered in zero order. So there's this question of why is electron-electron correlation so strong? And uh, at the time when uh, quantum wells were first invented, the gallium arsenide uh, uh, system, Schmidt Rink, Stefan Schmidt Rink began to think about this. And there are two independent factors. One is dimensionality, the other is screening. You know, so there's this marvelous thought experiment that you can do if you have, say, a three-dimensional semiconductor, say, gallium arsenide. And normally an exciton motion in gallium arsenide is a three-dimensional exciton. And it's strongly screened. The dielectric constant is somewhere around 10. You could take, you, if mentally, you take the electron and you force the electron hole to move in a plane instead of in the three-dimensional. And you solve for the exciton motion in two dimensions, not changing the Coulomb attraction. Uh, the binding energy for the exciton is four times as large, and the average distance between the electron and the hole is one-fourth what it is in three dimensions. So you see there's this pure dimensionality kinetic effect, the balance between the Coulomb and the kinetic energy of motion that uh, shifts strongly towards the Coulomb in two dimensions. If you do the same thing in one dimension, you consider motion along a line in gallium arsenide, the Coulomb energy actually diverges. You know, so for this kind of argument, pure dimensionality of the balance between kinetic energy and Coulomb, uh, one dimension is best. And the carbon nanotube is in that limit. It's almost a one-dimensional system. The other one that I've already mentioned is this uh, screening of the Coulomb interaction. You know, when uh, that's especially important for these pi systems because the electrons are right on the surface of the pi system. 
they're fringing out into the vacuum, the Coulomb interaction is much higher, so that when you talk about graphene or two-dimensional systems or the carbon nanotubes, both of these things are going on. Uh, reduction in the Coulomb screening and uh, reduction in dimensionality. Here's a direct comparison of the cadmium selenide and the carbon nanotube. You know. uh, here, the Coulomb interaction is taken into account first-order perturbation theory. This is the uh, kinetic energies are actually larger than the Coulomb interaction. Here, it's the reverse. Coulomb interaction is larger, kinetic energies are smaller. The other great difference between these systems, this is SP2 and this is SP3, no surface states. That makes a huge difference in practical application. And these systems have surface states. So carbon nanotubes have apparently the strongest electron-electron interaction of any nanosystem that we know about. Uh, this has been challenged. This point of view has been challenged in the last two years by some of these two-dimensional systems. And let me finish by talking about them. Uh, one of them is these lead iodide perovskite systems that have become very popular recently in uh, solar cell design. You know, and so lead, lead iodide perovskites form a cubic three-dimensional material. This is a system in which there's a lead, uh, a lead atom surrounded by six iodines, and the charge uh, is balanced by uh, methyl ammonium ions in interstitial, interstitial places a cubic three-dimensional bulk material. If you choose a larger counter ion, a long, suppose you have uh, octal um, ammonium ion, in, that's too big to sit in the interstitial space. And so in the synthesis, that will make a layered van der Waals crystal rather than a cubic bulk three-dimensional crystal. And so this, these cartoons are meant to be you know, so these are, say, octal ammonium ions. Uh, it's a van der Waals system. This is one perov This is the lead iodide perovskite, uh, single layer, two layers thick, three layers thick. All of these can be made. Uh, they're being made in John Owen's lab. And the bulk material uh, emits at 1.6. This M equal 2 material emits at 2.0. And this, uh, the one, the one layer thick material emits about uh, 2.4. Visible emission and higher quantum yield. Two things are going on in here. One is there is a quantum size effect because there's a delocalization of the band structure in this vertical direction. And so in the one layer thick material, you know, there's a quantum size effect in the z direction here. That shifts the band gap into the visible part of the reason. In the, but that there, in addition, there's a very strong increase of the excitonic structure. And let me show you that on the next slide. Oh, this is just a cartoon of of this uh, increase of the uh, Coulomb interaction in two dimensions, showing this idea that in three dimensions, you know, you have a weak exciton binding because the Coulomb interaction is weak and it's a three-dimensional system. Exciton exists, a small gap below the beginning of the uh, continuous absorption. In two dimensions, the whole system is shifted further into the visible, but the splitting between the exciton and the continuous absorption is much larger, and the optical strength of the exciton is growing. That's clearly seen in the spectra. This has been known since the 1990s. Here's this uh, Japanese paper that uh, shows the three-dimensional optical spectra, the cubic material now, the bulk semiconductor of this material, versus the two-dimensional material. And so you see this weak material has, this, three, this three-dimensional cubic material has continuous optical bands and very weak excitonic structure at 1.6. Uh, this is a 4 degree Kelvin absorption spectra. Here's the optical spectrum of the two dimensional material. Huge oscillator strength, the excitons shifted into the visible, much more striking structure above that. It directly shows you. This is ex the oscillator strength of this is about as strong as it can possibly get. So the binding of the exciton for, uh, below the continuous band structure for this material is uh, 320 MeV. And here, I think it's uh, 37 MeV. So it's just an example of what I was trying to say, this very strong dimensionality Coulomb interaction. Just in the last two years, uh, another class of these materials has been discovered in the, in the MOS2 family. In the MOS2 family, similar, you know, there's a, a central metal atom here with sulfur coordination around it. And uh, this makes a hexagonal sheet like this. 
there's a very interesting thing going on in the band structure of these materials. Now, this is the bulk band structure of MOS2 for the infinite crystal. And so the infinite crystal is an indirect gap material. You know, it has a uh, top of the valence band right here. If you look at the bonding at the top of the valence band, there's, uh, there's bonding between the sulfur atom here and the sulfur atom in the next layer above it, like that. And so if you, and so this delocalization of the top of the valence band like this is lost when you have just a single sheet, exfoliated sheet of MOS2. And so that's a quantum size effect in the vertical direction here. It pushes down this top of the valence band. It makes this indirect gap larger than the direct gap here. Direct gap is delocalized only in the plane because it, it involves uh, crystal orbital split d orbitals on the MO atoms. It's delocalized in the plane like the graphene system itself. So in a single layer of this material, in a single layer, it's actually direct gap and strongly luminescent. And it has, in fact, really strong exotonic structure as well. And a good example of that comes from this uh, recent calculation by Stephen Louie and his group um, using correlated electron theoretical methods, you know, just this last year in Physical Review Letters. So this is the GW uh, theory for uh, involving electron hole correlation. This is the absorption spectrum of uh, MOS2 as Louis predicts it to be. Uh, with, with correlation, the black line, and without correlation, just the continuous band theory. And you see the tremendous change in the optical spectrum. It's totally transformed by the involving the, uh, the uh, direct correlation. Uh, for, this is a two-dimensional system now. And you see there are all of these strong exotonic peaks, uh, and, and there's a maybe six or eight-tenths of a volt binding between the lowest exotonic peak and the uh, beginning of the continuous absorption. This is actually the spectrum that's observed experimentally in the lower trace here. And uh, what Louis claims is, in fact, that you know, the, the relaxation of these higher levels, a series of discrete higher states, is uh, because the vibrational relaxation is so fast to the lowest exciton that it, you just see this spectrum. This is actually very reminiscent of the spectrum in a quantum dot. You know, in principle, in zero order, you have discrete states, although close together at higher energies in a quantum dot. But the relaxation is so fast that you'd simply recover the band structure except for the lowest exciton, maybe the second lowest exciton as well. So this morning I have tried to tell you a little bit about my imperfect memory of what we were doing in the 1980s and how we stumbled from one thing to the next in, the, in this development of this methodology for working with quantum dots. And I've also tried to tell you about these uh, very strong electron correlation that exists in these other systems. SP3 hybridized quantum dots, uh, their properties result from simple co quantum confinement, the individual quantum confinement of the electron in the hole. Surface states are a big problem. And the electron hole Coulomb interaction is relatively minor. That's because, you know, the, for the wave functions for a, a quantum dot have nodes on the surface of the particle. So the electron density is mostly inside. And so the electron field begins on one and terminates on the other. It mostly stays inside the particle. So you still have substantially the same screening that you have in the bulk material, unlike the two-dimensional systems, unlike the graphene. But in, the chem in chemistry, quantum dots are really new classes of large molecules. And as we've seen, they're excellent chromophores when a lot of work is put into their synthesis. These graphene systems are uh, sp2 and unique in many ways. Ballistic transport, huge physical strength, uh, you know, the <coughs> graphene and diamond have the highest um, uh, bonding energy of any system in all of nature, basically, highest atomization energy. So that makes them really strong, and many of their special useful properties come from this huge physical strength. Two, 2D systems, you know, such as the MOS2 system, can show a very strong electron correlation equal to the correlation in carbon nanotubes, and that's because, in fact, they involve, I think, the uh, d orbital they're D bands, D bands in the bulk material, you know, and so the kinetic energy of the delocalization, the dispersion is relatively low, and therefore it's that much easier to make excitons out of that when the dispersion is low for D band materials. I myself like to do theory, I like to do spectroscopy, but I think the truth is uh, the synthesis and the materials technology is really the essential aspect of this, like it is in most branches of chemistry. 
you know, progress occurs when people make better and better samples. And um, we're seeing that now after all of these decades of work in the, in, in the synthesis of the, of the nanocrystals, their quality is getting to be high enough that they can actually be used for things. So I thank you very much for your attention, uh, for my imperfect thoughts this morning. <laughs>